Green and uh, host of Behind the Scenes on EW Radio here on Sirius XM 105. Emma's latest film is Disney's Beauty and the Beast, the live action version of the classic cartoon that we've all watched. It's out nationwide on Friday, March 17th. Thank you for joining us, Emma. Thank you for having me. And if this interview goes badly, just fair warning, you will all be transformed into pots and pans and housewares. <laughs> have to live in the serious office for a decade until we can fix things. <laughs> um, Emma, I wanna, in our conversation for the magazine, yeah. you talked about something that I would love to explore a little further, yeah. Bell Boot Camp. Yes. Uh, singing, horseback riding, dancing, these were all things you said you were not an expert in before you began work on this film. So tell us about what Bell Boot Camp involves. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy for me to think now, but you know, at the beginning of this process, I had never ridden a horse before. Um, I had never sang in a movie before, and I'd certainly never done, you know, a Strictly Come Dancing-esque four-minute, you know, full-on waltz. So um, there was quite a lot that I had to, um, yeah, just had to learn, really, really start from scratch on. And uh, it's so fun to do a movie when you get to, at the end of it, you get to take away new skills um, with you. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, how much, how long did that process last so before the film camp was three months a full three months of singing lessons three or four times a week writing three or four times a week and dancing four times a week do you sing the songs from the movie or are you stretching your voice and strengthening your voice by singing you know, other the songs? first person who's asked me that and actually um my singing teacher had me sing other disney songs so oh, i actually really? started off learning and singing songs from pocahontas and aladdin and because there's kind of a really interesting kind of Disney, uh, I don't know what I would call it, like, like a style, a kind of style, exactly, mm -hmm. and which is kind of in between classical and sort of theatrical music and pop. It kind of sits in that middle place between the three different genres, mm. and so you kind of there's almost like a there's a different tone you need to bring to that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I sang lots of Disney songs. <laughs> yeah. Did you already have them memorized? From I growing didn't. Up yeah. with those I songs? didn't have. I didn't have very many lyrics to that. <laughs> I really. I mean, it's pretty amazing to to actually do a piece of work where you're like, oh, I already know this scene <laughs> <laughs> because I just, as a child, you kind of just absorb it all through osmosis. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah. Now yeah, my children can almost recite Beauty and the Beast like they could perform it. Just a little two little boy and girl show, one two girl yeah, show. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, so Dan Stevens is your co-star in this. He plays the prince, the beast. Yes. Um, what are you looking at when you're shooting this? We see him in the, the fully rendered beast mode. Right. But what is he, what does he look like when you're acting in real life with him? So where we ended up, because we tried at the beginning of the movie uh, to put down in full prosthetics and do all of that, and eventually we decided that we would uh, that Dan would be a uh, 3D kind of mm -hmm. special effect. Mm -hmm. So the way that they did it was that we would shoot the scene together and he would be in kind of a suit which would give him the size and shape of the beast. And then we would go in and we would shoot our scenes again later and they would, they would it's called motion capture his facial expressions. And they'd use those facial expressions to animate what would become the beast. Um, mm -hmm. later on. So it was a pretty complicated process, two-step process, but for me it was wonderful because when I when I worked with Harry Potter or when I did other movies that have special effects, mm -hmm. usually I get like a tennis ball or I get like an LED light or I get, <laughs> you know, like an X marks the spot and that's what I'm acting with. So um, for me to actually have an actor there with me on set mm -hmm. was, was kind of a luxury. So that, was he, that aspect was great. Would he be in costume? So or? he wouldn't be in costume. It was really for the animators it was mm -hmm. to, to kind of get the size and shape of the beast and so he was in kind of a gray lycra mm -hmm. muscle suit that's the best <laughs> way i can explain it and he was on stilts but he wasn't furry or anything yeah yeah Does that make sense? <laughs> just had little yeah. dots yeah, yeah. Like that. he had dots and he was like muscled up did he have like the gear the camera gear like sometimes they have a light and a camera on their face to record yeah that. no he had no that. dangling cameras or anything mm -hmm. like that i mean he was pretty unencumbered minus mm -hmm. the stilts um which we did the dance in i would like to point out we did that full waltz with dan in like proper kind of God, I don't even know how many inches probably like three or four inch sort of steel stilts really? so yeah, because when you think of what you know, when you think about the dance, you're like, well, it's challenging to do the dance, but to do it with someone that's trying to balance and is wearing this kind of big 
um, ungainly <laughs> suit. It's yeah, it's challenging. Yeah. Um, what was Beast Boot Camp like? Do you have any sense of that? <laughs> Beast Boot Camp was, I think, mostly figuring out the the stilts and the suit and mm -hmm. how everything was going to translate. And I think Dan, Dan, like me, had never sung for a movie before, so the, both of us were really trying to get mm -hmm. to grips with. Um, the singing aspect of things. So the other beings in the castle, you have uh, uh, Miss, uh, Madame Garderobe, the wardrobe, played by Audra McDonald. You have Lumiere, played by Ewan McGregor. Cogsworth is Ian McKellen. Mrs. Potts, of course, is yes, Emma Thompson. Yes, yes. You're acting with these um, objects, and they're digitally created for the film, but what are you working with? A similar question to what you did with Dan there. In that case, are you working with a tennis ball? Are you working with a light, or are they real? Puppetry yeah, so involved in the film? No, so the household objects were just like, it was just a teapot, which would later be animated. Mm -hmm. And um, sadly, we didn't have the actors there on set for those mm -hmm. bits. So I was either reacting to a voice recording or, I was, or Bill would be reading mm -hmm. a line for a teapot or, or whatever else. So it was a bit kind of cobbled together, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially scenes like be our guest, yeah. where I'm sat at the table and all of this stuff is happening in front of me. Um, I mean, that's one thing, figuring out how to kind of be in a scene with something that isn't there, but when they're like, it's a candlestick, and it's doing a backflip, <laughs> and it's doing this, and then it does this, and you're like, oh my god, how, I'm, how am I going to kind of remember all of these intricate mm -hmm. different steps and all this crazy stuff that's going on and make it look as if I'm really reacting to it, especially when it's so specific, mm -hmm. you know. He's tasting the he's tasting the dish or he's doing mm -hmm. this or doing that. So it, it was um that scene took forever. I have to say of all the for scenes you, in the, to, to, for to, me, to. for all the scenes of all the scenes in the movie, that was the killer. Mm -hmm. We were there for weeks trying to get that right. And it's just so frustrating because it's so, such an intangible, you know, you just have nothing to really go on. And Belle's role in that is somewhat passive. She's the audience for exactly, their performance. So exactly. It's not like there's much you can do besides 100%. react. I'm really just sat there, kind of, <laughs> you know, try, trying to react to what I'm supposedly going on. So, um, yeah. Was yeah. there any uh, puppetry involved? No puppetry. Um, no. I thought maybe I, the wardrobe might have been oh, uh, somewhat Oh, actually, mechanical. yeah, sorry, no, the wardrobe, um, she wasn't in Be Our Guest, but she is kind of, the wardrobe sort of belongs in Belle's bedroom, what becomes Belle's bedroom, and that was a kind of animatronic wardrobe that mm -hmm. would do, had various different things that it could do. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what were its well, it capabilities? Kind of, it was interesting, it, it could kind of like shift to and to and fro, and some of the drawers would open and close, the mouth would move, mm -hmm. um, like little things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but c at least I had, you know, something to, to, <laughs> to pretend was alive. So you, you mentioned uh, your work on the Harry Potter films prepared you for this. Well, you've done a lot of acting opposite visual effects. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the more surreal experiences, even maybe from the past? That, You've Gosh. just felt uh, it's almost becomes absurd when you talk yeah. to actors about, you know, like you say, having to act with a tennis ball or, or um, a dangling light. I remember <laughs> the Quidditch games were pretty absurd because <laughs> that was all green screen. And what you essentially have is an AD, an assistant director mm -hmm. with a microphone who is essentially narrating the action. So you're stood in a stand mm -hmm. and they're saying, you know, and Slytherin scores, and so everyone has to like pretend as though that's going on, and <laughs> they count different. And because because the Quidditch players are moving so quickly, they'd be reading. So you'd have like numbers that you'd follow as it, like kind of like join the dots, which would sort of create the action. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they score, and then this happens, and so you kind of like, your brain kind of feels a bit frazzled because you're, you know, you're trying to play along mm -hmm. to something that. It's not that. <laughs> um, that's acting. Yeah. Isn't it? I think that's what a lot of theater acting is yes, too, right? Yes, so much yes. suspension of disbelief. Yes. Um, was there anything you saw in the finished version of Beauty and the Beast that surprised you? Sometimes I'll talk to actors and they'll say, "Oh, that's what that's what we were doing." <laughs> like they didn't fully grasp it as the yeah. director was explaining it. But then when they see, and sometimes things change in post production. Was there anything that surprised you um, when you saw it? Gosh, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, I think really, as I said before, just there was so much that was 
I mean, the sets and things were all real, so in a, in a sense, I, you know, there was a good, good lot mm -hmm. of it that I knew what it was going to look like, but um, I mean, really, Dan, uh, Beast, mm -hmm. was seeing that kind of over the process of the movie, you know, between the final cut and the first cut of the movie that I saw, um, just remarkable what they achieved with making him so real and, and human and alive and, and whatever else. I think mm -hmm. that was the biggest kind of, wow, this is really happening before my eyes and looks amazing. Yeah. So uh, we, I'll just do a little reset here. You're listening to the Sirius Town Hall <laughs> on EW Radio, Sirius XM 105. We're talking with Emma, Tom Emma Watson about the... Uh, <laughs> sorry, not, not Mrs. Nearly. Potts. Nearly. <laughs> uh, Emma Watson about uh, the new Beauty and the Beast film. Uh, we've talked a lot about the independence of Belle, which yes. I think is a, a fundamental part of the 1991 animated film. Yes. But um, you felt like there was a need to, uh, 20 years later, to add a little more to the... To this story, mm. uh, partly because it's a new, you're giving it a new dimension, literally mm. a new dimension. <laughs> yeah. Um, talk to me about the uh, the changes that you feel this movie makes to the character of Belle in terms of uh, uh, strengthening her. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's always a collaboration. You always you always get given a script, and then the director obviously has very strong ideas, and then and then you try and shift things a little bit as an actor in, in the direction of of how you imagine the character, mm -hmm. but um, it's, always a, it's always a bit of a tussle, but I think, and obviously the original is so beloved, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to mess with something mm -hmm. that's pretty damn near perfect. Um, so, you know, I think it was a case of, for me, there was room, I think, taking an animated character and making her a real life breathing mm -hmm. person um, was her costume because in the original, she wears, I mean, it's so elegant, that the outfit, but, she, you know, she wears little ballet shoes and she has her, her little basket with her white napkin in it. And, you know, in ours, Belle does a ton of horse riding. And I immediately, when I saw the sketches, I thought, I'm not sure, I'm not sure anyone's going to buy that, mm -hmm. that she's going to be able to, to you know, um, race into the forest and go and save Beast. Um, in a pair of ballet shoes, it's just it's it's people aren't going to feel, and I think that's really important when you're doing fantasy is is to make sure that um, the audience only has to suspend its disbelief for a few moments. Mm -hmm. If you if if you're constantly kind of going, this just doesn't feel <laughs> authentic. I think it wears right. quickly. And anyway, so I put Belle in in like muddy riding boots and. We hitched up one side of her skirt and she wore bloomers underneath so that she could get off, up and off mm -hmm. the horse um, easily. Uh, I gave her kind of like a tool belt, mm -hmm. which she could carry her books around in and she could, she's kind of an inventor in our story. She could carry her, her tools and, and whatnot, um, as opposed to like, you know, the, the basket, which mm -hmm. again, with a horse and all sorts of things going on, just, just not very practical. So small things like that. And then... You know, we had the chance to explore a bit more. Okay, so what happened to Belle's mother? What does she do with her spare time? Mm -hmm. Little things like that. She has a new small, very small song as well. Um, so we kind of padded out a bit more of her backstory mm -hmm. too, which was really fun. What I like is that she's not just uh, a character who likes to disappear into books. She's interested mm. in their educational value and yes. uses her engineering skills to create the yes. washing machine so that she could free up the other little girls who are not being taught in yes. school. We see the little boys marching into the classroom, yeah. but the girls are given laundry to do. No, yeah, you pointed that out last time, actually, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the village is very anti anti-intellectual, <laughs> anti-books, it's very anti-young women specifically getting to mm -hmm. learn. And yeah, that she, in, in our story, she's an activist in her own community. Mm -hmm. She's not just, she's not just pushing herself forward. She's trying to bring people with her. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why the village turn on her so much is that they don't like that she's, she's, she's progressive, essentially. Mm -hmm. She's, she, uh, she's trying to take things forward and they don't, they, they you know, change isn't, isn't totally welcome. <laughs> never is, is it? No. <laughs> oh, never no, asked for politely. It's no. got to be taken. Yeah. Um, I know that this is an important topic to you, and I know the Disney films are also very special to mm -hmm. you, the classic ones that go back decades. And it, we're talking about updating a film that's only, you know, was only made in 1991. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's, it's about 25 years old, and we've got this, uh, we've got films that go back 60, 70 years mm -hmm. now. 
Uh, so many of those films are much more about finding your Prince Charming, yes. literally finding yes. Prince Charming. Yes. Um, but as, as a fan of those, is there a way you would say, you know, parents should talk to their little kids who do love them? There are things to still love about them. It's not oh, that they should be sure. turned away, but... For sure. I mean, um, I think that it's, for me, uh, just because in our story, for example, the way that things are moving, the princess isn't, isn't waiting to be rescued by the prince mm -hmm. or they're not looking for their prince charming. I don't think that should mean that the romance is dead. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what I love so much about this film is that it, it really does celebrate. It's unapologetically romantic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really is. And I think that is to be that is to be celebrated, I think in the world of, of like of Tinder and dating apps and whatever <laughs> else, we need it more than ever. So, um, I mean, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, I think that these stories used to be very gender specific mm -hmm. in the sense that girls supposed to wait for boy, boy mm -hmm. to, you know, and I think playing around with playing around with those gender roles mm -hmm. and the assumptions based on who should be doing what and how all of that should be playing out um, keeps those really relevant and mm -hmm. and um, you know I think I think both sexes and genders you know need and would like a bit of rescuing so <laughs> yeah there, you talk about romance and there's a, there's something in the film that is controversial to some but to me again as the father of two little kids mm -hmm. I really love there's there's talk of like a gay story, a gay love story in this, yes. which really is, it comes down to a couple of smiles yeah. and like a partial dance. But <gasps> LeFou has a crush on Gaston. Josh Gad's character has this sort of like well, veiled that, affection for yeah, Gaston. I, mean, I think that's what's so fantastic about um, Josh's performance mm -hmm. is that it's so subtle. It's always like, does he idolize Gaston? Is he in love with Gaston? Like what is kind of, What's the relationship mm -hmm. there? And I think it's it's incredibly subtle, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. I don't want people going into this movie thinking that there's like a huge uh, sort of narrative there. Mm -hmm. There really isn't. It's incredibly subtle, and it's kind of a play on on having the audience go, "Is it? Is it? Is it not?" Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's fun. I mean, I think that it's sort of I love the ambiguity of mm -hmm. that. It's really. It's, it's interesting. The, the whole movie, though, I think takes um, an effort to expand its horizons a little bit. Is it's, not, it's, it's set in the south of France, but it's not like the village is full of, of white characters. Yes, you have yes. a, a sort of multicultural population. And when I talked to the director, Bill Condon, about this, he said, well, you know, um, it could be that they came from Morocco. Like there's the, he said there's some yeah. logic to it, but also it's a movie about a girl who falls in love with a man who's magically been transformed into a beast and has yeah. candle friends. Like maybe we could suspend this belief a little bit more to just yeah. say all sorts of people can live think, in this village. You know, ultimately these parts and these roles, fairy tales in general, are full of are full of archetypes mm -hmm. and universal themes. And each time of each time a new generation tells these stories they they use these fairy tales as a as a mirror for their own society and their own culture mm -hmm. and we live in a diverse culture and society we live in a global world and i think bill felt that it was very important that the film represent that diverse mm -hmm. society represent the the more the more global world that we live in and and um yeah and that's that's why our, our movie does that so it, Wednesday was International Women's Day, and you're yes. active with the United Nations He for She program. Yes. Feminism, as we've already discussed, is mm. very important to you. How did you spend the day? So I spend the day book ninjuring, <laughs> which is my, which is which is the way that I describe it. Actually, um, there's a there's an organization that I work with called they call themselves book fairies. Mm -hmm. um, but I did five different book drops around um, iconic sort of feminist locations in New York. So I went and I left books next to the Gertrude Stein statue, the Eleanor Roosevelt, the Joan of Arc, um, and the Blue Stockings Library, um, sorry, books, Blue Stockings um, Radical Bookstore. And there was one more which I'm missing off. Was it Gloria Steinem's house? Was oh, I did that in the <laughs> evening. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was busy. I was running mm -hmm. around all over town. Um, yeah, it's, it's really fun. Um, anyway. It's really fun. 
Go ahead. And, and I loved, because it's kind of become a thing now, a few people who saw me were like, you're doing the thing, you're leaving the book. So I was like, <laughs> yes, yeah, I am. Um, so it's nice because, you know, I think sometimes people see the books and they're like, I, they must be for someone else or whatever else. But people or now, someone forgot it. Yeah, yeah or someone left <laughs> it or whatever. Um, so people are picking them up now and they're more curious and, and, and whatever else. So it's nice. I saw a headline that said, Emma Watson is uh, leaving books all over the world. And I thought, when did she get Santa Claus powers? I like, know. So, <laughs> so fun. So you had helpers all around the world yeah, doing so the book did, fairies? After I did the first book drop, um, I started getting letters from mm -hmm. all over the world being like, come and do it in you know, Dubai, come mm -hmm. and do it in Japan or, or wherever. And so um, Cordelia and I, who, who, helps, me, who helps me do it, um, we sort of coordinated this international um, book drop where we had volunteers from every country uh, and we sent them books and, and they went and mm -hmm. left them around. It was, it was remarkable. We actually managed to do 26 different countries wow. around the world. So, um, really fun. Watch really, out Easter Bunny. Really Too fun. Fair, I know. Watson. I'm coming for you. <laughs> I'm after your job. <laughs> What were the books that you, uh, are they the same? Is there a, a, a no, limited so number of books or a cool variety? No, so this was the other cool thing was that previously we, I would leave books for that specific month of my book club, whatever our book club choice was. Mm -hmm. We actually left books from, from you know, the last oh, I think six or seven months. We, we left six or seven different feminist titles. Mm -hmm. So we had Gloria Steinem's new book, My Life on the Road. We had Caitlin Moran's How to Be a Woman. Mm -hmm. uh, we had The Color Purple by Alice Walker, Persepolis. Um, so yeah, we, we, we left a range of, of, different, of different ones. It was pretty cool. Do you foresee yourself continuing this in the future? Or it seems like you enjoy it a lot. I do. It's really fun. It's sort of... Um, civil disobedience is fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be advertising that. But um, yeah, it was... Uh, no, as long as, mm -hmm. as long as people keep asking and, and volunteering, I'm super down to keep doing it. What are you reading at the moment? I know you have Our Shared Shelf as your book yeah. club. Yeah, you know, my friend gave me for Christmas, um, she, uh, she's a psychiatrist, and she gave me Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, which is a pretty amazing book. Mm -hmm. It's got some pretty heavy subject matter, but it's actually surprisingly sort of readable, and it's, it's actually... It's actually very short, but um, yeah, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Really loved it. Some really good, really good words of wisdom in there. Mm -hmm. He's a very, uh, very clever man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when we spoke last time, it was a few days before the women's march, mm -hmm. and I know you participated in it. I, I saw some photos of you out. Were you with your mother? I was with my mom. Yeah. Where did you Where did you uh, march? Where, which city were you in? Was we flew to Washington D.C., oh. which was actually amazing because it was it was her who messaged me saying. No, when are we booking flights to DC? <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. Radical mom. Yeah, radical <laughs> mom, love it. Yeah, she was, uh, it's her first ever protest. Mm -hmm. It was my first ever protest. Um, and I think we loved that it just felt so, there was something that actually in the energy that felt very celebratory. Mm -hmm. It felt very celebratory of the work that we've done, that we continue to do. Um, it, it felt really joyful and I love the I love the age ranges as well mm -hmm. like lots of very young kids there mm -hmm. all the way through to you know grandmas marching for their granddaughters mm -hmm. like it was very cross-generational and very peaceful and um yeah very very joyful mm -hmm. in its own way you know like serious but you know I think um it also had a great sense of humor mm -hmm. which is key it's absolutely key. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Why is that so important? I um, think you're right, but I'd love yeah, to hear why you think that's true. Yeah, I think true. as long as no one is... There's something about humor to me which speaks to humility, which, which speaks to, yeah, to being humble, to being human, to... It's such a way to connect people, and I think as long as you're not taking yourself too seriously, mm -hmm. Nothing can go too badly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah. It, it, when, when also, if there's, a, if there's a case of fear, you don't laugh when you're afraid. I think it's a, sh a sign of strength if yeah. you can laugh at something. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And um, yeah, it's uh, if you if you can find the funny side of things, and if you can laugh together in in very difficult moments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you say, I don't think there's a lot that can 
that can totally stop you or, or tear you down. It's, it's, a, it's a sign of resilience. Yeah, and yeah. Uni unity too. Unity right? and Anybody and who's seen a comedy in a movie theater knows yeah. it's more fun to laugh in a whole room full of people than, than it is alone. to laugh alone. Uh, for sure. Exactly. For sure. So. Um, we're talking with Emma Watson here on Sirius XM Entertainment Weekly Radio about her new film, Beauty and the Beast. And, uh, but also, you've got a lot on the horizon yes. in your future. Uh, uh, one of the films coming up in uh, just over a month is The Circle. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes out on April 28th. This is uh, based on a book by Dave Eggers. I believe he wrote the screenplay, too, didn't he? He did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's directed by James Ponsolt, yep. co-stars Tom Hanks. Uh, you play a young woman who's part of a new tech company, mm -hmm. a pioneering organization. Let's, can you tell us about the story of The Circle? Yeah, so the story's kind of about... What I love about the film is that it, it could kind of be now. It's, it's not set as a kind of like future dystopian mm -hmm. world. It's sort of like, okay, we're in 2000, let's say we're in 2017, and I'm going to imagine that all of these big tech companies became one kind of huge con conglomerate. Mm -hmm. and, and what would happen if they had the monopoly on our personal information? Mm -hmm. So, um, really, not very si science fictiony. It's, it's actually not that yeah. science fictiony <laughs> at all. It, and what that would mean for democracy, what mm -hmm. that would mean for civil rights, what that would mean for, you know, it's um, what that would mean is kind of like it's for relationships. Of, too. For relationships, right. it's kind of George Orwell's 1984, mm -hmm. but written for now mm -hmm. what would happen if this started to happen tomorrow and it's really interesting because it kind of it juggles what's private what's not mm -hmm. um what's personal information what should people be able to access not access um and it's yeah it, it deals with all of that um it's interesting because we made the movie before the election mm -hmm. but actually i think <laughs> now that the election has happened i think the film really I'll be interested to see what people think of it because I think it it kind of um, it speaks so much to what is going on sort of right now. Um, it's also about self surveillance, isn't it? It's about it is, how yeah. you behave when you're being watched, uh -huh. and and in a way we already do that. We tweet yes. about where we are. Yes. We Instagram about where we are. Yeah. Facebook updates. It's yeah. it's it reminds me of like uh, years ago. Our you know nieces would have to text their mom and dad to say whether they were the football game or where yeah. they were. And, uh, and, and now it's like, yeah, now yeah. we do that sort of, you don't even have to be asked. You voluntarily give out your coordinates yeah. every few minutes. <laughs> I think also it looks at the effects of, of constantly being so self-aware mm -hmm. and always being ready to smile for a picture, always ready to be on camera, always ready to share a detail of your life and to be constantly kind of like curating your life. Mm -hmm whether it be like what you're eating for breakfast through to what you're saying to a friend mm -hmm. and the kind of like paranoia and that that kind of gives birth to and how just like exhausting it is for human beings to constantly feel like they need to be on mm -hmm. um, and the kind of toll that, that, that that's taking I think is really interesting. I think for me just recently I have had to put some boundaries on because you can access everything instantly from your phone, mm -hmm. it's so much more difficult now, I feel like, to get any kind of reprieve from it all. It's mm -hmm. a constant inundation of emails, social media alerts, news alerts, media alerts, whatever else. And you, you know, sometimes it kind of feels like, whoa, this is, this is a lot to manage constantly. Overload. It's overload. Mm -hmm. I actually recently deleted my mail off app off my phone so to make me go and you know sit down on the computer and actually be like okay now I'm going to do this one thing at a time or now I'm going to check the news one thing at a time mm -hmm. because I found that I would be constantly doing like six things at once or reading six different articles. I would be on Twitter and messaging someone and looking at Instagram and reading the news and an email and like I was like, oh my Hard God. Hard to live in the moment. Yeah, it's very difficult that, right? to be present. And very difficult to be present and very difficult to kind of, you lose your focus. And really as human beings, like I mm -hmm. feel like the most valuable thing that we have is our time and our attention. Mm -hmm. And if our, our attention and our time is constantly being eaten by those things, you know, we, we're letting these things eat our most valuable commodity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've had to put some boundaries in place, I think. I think being part of the film really made me think about these things a lot more than I was maybe thinking about them before. Yeah, I wondered how much of it was your feeling about it before you came in and how much did the film change your perspective on? Yeah, I think for sure, I, I know it did. Mm -hmm. And I, it's one of the reasons I wanted to do the movie because I was like, 
you know, it was something that I read mm -hmm. and I couldn't really stop thinking about. And I always know that's some, that's the kind of movie that I mm -hmm. want to be in if days or weeks later I'm like, hmm, oh, you know, I'm still pondering an aspect <laughs> of it or I want to talk about, or, you know, and I would still, I mean, I constantly, I still call Dave and I go, what do you think about this? Is there mm -hmm. an answer to this? Is there a solution to this? Is there a whatever? I mean, the, the film, like a lot of great films do, I think, like throws up a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I think audience members will come out and want to go for a beer so that they can <laughs> really kind of like hash it out. That's a good movie, one that you can have a conversation about yeah, after, the, yeah, after the fact. I think so. So Tom Hanks plays a kind of, I think on the surface you'd say he's sort of a Steve Jobs type. He's the head of this company, mm -hmm. but he's also very charismatic. Yes. Um, uh, w are there any other like real life figures that factor into the type of person he plays. Oh. He's not playing anybody from real life, but interesting. Is there a Bill Gates element? Is there? I think what's so terrifying about mm -hmm. Bailey, as you say, is that he's incredibly powerful, mm -hmm. but and smart. But he also has this kind of deeply charismatic, almost like showman mm -hmm. element to him, which I feel like makes him slightly un unstoppable because he can mm -hmm. sell even the worst idea ever to you and make you feel as if you've just won the lottery. Because he looks like Tom Hanks. Well, because <laughs> right? Tom Hanks is like, yeah. who wouldn't buy anything from Tom Hanks? I of mean, course. I trust him know. with my life. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I would put, if I was going to put my life in anyone's hands, it would probably be Tom. So I think he brings, he brings that to the role mm -hmm. and it makes, it makes it incredibly complex, the way that you feel about mm -hmm. Bailey, very complex, um, which is fun. Um, it's fun. I think Tom really enjoyed playing the role because he could really he gets manipulate be, that. He gets know. to be terrifying. Yeah, he gets against to be that. scary. Uh, you also uh, co starred with John Boyega in the film. Tell me about I who do. he plays. Uh, yeah, um, so he plays one of the kind of the. There's kind of this triumvirate, there's this, this mm -hmm. triangle of power at the, at the top of this company, and John Boyega kind of plays the young genius mm -hmm. who kind of had the idea, started this company in his garage, masterminded the whole thing. And um, and he kind of has now. What regrets. have I done? Yeah, he what kind of like he was the one who unlocked this beast that he didn't mm -hmm. that he didn't realize what it could become, and um, is kind of desperately trying to stuff the genie back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a great part. It was wonderful to work with him and. Um, Actually, really funny, I, I worked opposite two other Brits, so mm -hmm. John Boyega and then my friend in the movie is played um, by Karen Gillian, a uh, fantastic mm -hmm. actress um, who's actually Scottish. Uh, so the three of us were like, <laughs> you know, we were like putting on our American accents. Um, <laughs> Tom was like, how did you Brits get in here? Like, what are you, you know, how did we end up with this? But um, yeah, it was very fun. Uh, another actor you appear with in the film is Bill Paxton, who yes. sadly just passed away. He plays your father. Yes. And is one of the pressures on your character that she has, he's, he's sick. Yeah. But um, what's wrong with him? And can you talk about working with Bill? Um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so Bill plays my father who, um, is doesn't have the medical insurance that he needs basically um, in order to have himself taken care of properly and he's sort of slowly destabilizing he's sort of slowly going downhill and I think the sense of powerlessness that May feels that she can't stop this and she can't help him is the way that the circle really get its claws into her because they start to sort of through her he gets medical insurance that she can take care of him mm -hmm. And it's it's a way that they begin that she begins to feel so indebted to this company that she she sort of stops being able to have a way out or really to have a sense of her own mind or identity. And I think that that's a very emotive way to sort of control someone is mm -hmm. is uh, if you feel that that care that's there for your family is going to go. A responsibility, um, yeah. Yeah, and responsibility. Um, yeah, I think I think that's. That's a tough one. Um, so, mm -hmm. so the film, the film really, really deals with that. And um, yeah, I, I hope you won't mind if I don't talk about Bill. But it's it's um, it was very sad. And yeah, I enjoy working with him a lot. Yeah, he was a wonderful guy. I met him many times, interviewing him, and he had a real everyman quality to him, just like Tom Hanks in some ways, very warm. Yeah, and yeah, no, it mm -hmm. was a it was a bit of a shock. I'm still mm -hmm. reeling a bit. Yeah, well. Um, 
you know, uh, another uh, story I read recently that I actually didn't know very much about, but La La Land just won, yes. uh, didn't win Best Picture, but won the Oscar <laughs> for, uh, yes. for Emma Stone. Yes. And uh, uh, that you, this was a role that you were potentially up for. Can you, uh, I've read a lot of conflicting reports. Can you sort of clarify, were you up for this part? Mm -hmm. And how do you feel now? You know, it's one of these frustrating things where sort of names get attached to projects mm -hmm. very early on as a way to kind of build anticipation or excitement for mm -hmm. something that's coming before it's really anything is actually sort of agreed or, or set in stone and it's very common but um you know it was one of those situations where i had been committed to beating the beast at that point for gosh well the the idea of the project itself for years actually and then at disney had been attached to that for a number of months and you know, I knew, as we talked about before, mm -hmm. that this wasn't a movie I could just sort of step into. I mm -hmm. knew I had to, I knew I had horse training, I knew I had dancing, I knew I, I knew I had three months of singing ahead of me, and I knew I had to be in London mm -hmm. to, to really do that. And this wasn't, this wasn't a movie I could just kind of um, parachute into. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew I had to do the work, and, uh, and I had to be, I had to be where I had to be. So, you know, scheduling conflict-wise, it just, it didn't work out, but I'm so thrilled that musicals are so celebrated at the moment, <laughs> that they seem to be back in the zeitgeist and um, that people are kind of celebrating and loving music and singing and dancing again. And I thought the film was wonderful and um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's lovely. Do you, is that something you'd like to do more of in the future now that you've been through Bell Boot Camp? Now that I've been through <laughs> Bell Boot Camp, I can take anything. I am ready for anything now. But would um, you like uh, musicals? Is that something you'd like to yeah, do? Yeah, I would actually. I, I just, you know, at first the singing thing for me was really tough. I felt very, very vulnerable, honestly. Mm -hmm. There's something about when you, when you act or you play a character, there's something a little bit to hide behind. Mm -hmm. But when you sing, there's like this vulnerability that I, I cannot even begin to mm. explain to you. It's so raw. There's, mm -hmm. there's just nowhere to hide. <laughs> and um, I also had this weird neurotic paranoia that I was like um, Floris Foster Jenkins, you know, that oh. Meryl Streep part that she played recently. Right. And that no one around me could bring themselves to tell me that I was actually, in fact, a terrible, <laughs> terrible singer. And I carried this around with me for months. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a barrier I had to break through, whereas like, you got to get a grip on yourself, Em, mm -hmm. because I knew I would be performing some of this stuff live. I knew I'd be doing it in front of a huge audience. I knew mm -hmm. this musical was beloved. Um, you know, it's mildly terrifying singing with Alan Menken. He's one of the most talented, incredible composers of, in my mind, of all mm -hmm. time. I mean, I think it would be fair to to use the word genius in, mm -hmm. in his in that context. And um, yeah, I really kind of had to find this kind of belief in myself and and kind of and push through and um but i i lo loved it once once i once i got myself there um it's such a it's so much fun mm -hmm. it really really is in our previous conversation you said you hadn't met with paige o'hara who uh did the singing and the voice of Belle in the animated film, but was she at the, she was at the premiere, did you cross paths there? We d yeah, the LA premiere, I have to say, was really overwhelming for me because it was the first time I'd ever met Paige, who played mm -hmm. the original Belle in the mm -hmm. animated movie. Um, I met Linda Wolverton, who wrote my character. She's written a ton of Disney movies. She, she was involved in The Lion King, among mm -hmm. other things. She wrote Maleficent. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, so I was like, oh, Paige, Linda, Alan Menken, the whole <laughs> cast, oh my God. And then Celine Dion comes out of nowhere. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so overwhelming. Um, and she is someone who, you know, I don't come from a family that are particularly theater or movie mm -hmm. or Hollywood orientated, but my mom loves Celine Dion. <laughs> and I love Celine Dion. And we used to listen to Celine Dion together. And I was just like, so psyched to tell her that she had she had been such a part of my childhood mm -hmm. that the movie had been such a big part of my childhood and and you know and to get to meet her and and for her to be part of our movie this new version for her to si she sings the song over the credits at the end um it's just such a i mean it doesn't wow. really get any better than that does it yeah, i want a soundtrack true. with celine dion <laughs> i mean come on it's so cool um so yeah so some some good moments but Wow, I stepped off that red carpet and I was like, I need to sit down for a minute. <laughs> this was this was a lot. Did you just uh, in, have a uh, cross paths with Paige O'Hara 
momentarily or did you get to talk about Belle? Like you have <gasps> this shared experience between I know. you. You know what? We didn't get to talk for mm -hmm. very long. I spoke to Linda Wolverton for longer actually because mm -hmm. I, I, I ended up speaking to her about some of the script stuff and the mm -hmm. story stuff and there was some stuff I wanted to understand better but um, that was my first time meeting Paige. Mm. You've been on the other side of this, uh, having played Hermione Granger in the Harry Potter films. Yeah. You've watched another actress pick up the role of this character for the stage show Harry Potter yes, and the Curse yes. of Child, uh, uh, Noma Dumasweni. And uh, you said you were overwhelmed by the feeling of seeing her perform because it felt good to see Hermione oh, live. Oh, yeah. Oh, my carried God. Carried on. It's so funny because I went, I went to see the stage production with so... Well, I guess I just didn't think that... I, I just didn't think through what it could mm -hmm. mean to me. I didn't know what to expect, really. So I went in with very... Just, like, I don't know, without thinking about it too much, mm -hmm. I guess. And, and, and I was not prepared for how emotional it was for me to meet Noma, who plays the new Hermione. She kind of... She came into... I was in, like, a little room off the side of the theatre, mm -hmm. and she came in and... and gave me this big hug and I just burst into tears I was like it was so emotional for me to know that Hermione was going to be okay mm -hmm. and that everything kind of worked out and like what her future would look like and it was also such a relief kind of in a way to share her with someone mm -hmm. because yeah to share that with another person and to know what it was like to be part of that it's that like character's life. I don't know how to explain it's like it. It's like a horcrux in a way, isn't it? it because is. she's now living in another person. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's so true. And Positive I, And also horcrux. I felt like, you know, being part of Harry Potter was something I grew up with and I was in it for over a decade mm -hmm. and I had been part of this family. And then the theatre group welcomed me like I was part of their family mm -hmm. immediately. And that was really emotional for me too because they made me feel that I was still part of it. Mm -hmm. And... That was very moving for me too, I think. Um, but I loved it. It's so good. If you're in London and you get the chance to go and see it, you, you must go and see it. It's, it's, it's really, really brilliant. Now, uh, the character uh, that she, as she plays her is in middle age. Mm -hmm. um, do, in, as the years go by, do you ever foresee a return on screen as Hermione? I know, I know there's a lot of like contracts You don't know what you're doing. You're causing, <laughs> you're causing carnage. No, I... Um, Definitely nothing planned at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I. We only just finished our. Se uh, it was not <laughs> so long ago that we finished our original series, and I wouldn't want to get anyone's anyone's hopes up for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask you again in twenty years. Uh, yeah, ask me. In, <laughs> ask me in another ten. Ten. Okay. Yeah, give me another ten, <laughs> and then we'll talk about it. I want to thank you for being here with us. Thank the audience for sitting in on our conversation. That's going to do it for our Entertainment Weekly Radio Town Hall with Emma Watson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you can watch Emma play Belle on the big screen in Disney's Beauty and the Beast on Friday, March seventeenth. Let's hear it for Emma Watson. Thank you.